Hello and welcome back to this GCSE chemistry revision course brought to you by revisechemistry.uk. Today we're going to be looking at the history of the periodic table, the current periodic table, group 1, group 7 and group 0. It wasn't that long ago that scientists believed that the elements that we had discovered could not be arranged in any kind of pattern. A scientist who is often credited with the title of the father of the modern periodic table is Dmitry Mendeleev. Dmitry Mendeleev worked on a periodic table design that incorporated not only the atomic masses of the elements that had been discovered, but he also used the idea that different elements had different properties and those properties could be seen almost as if repeating patterns throughout the table. This put him ahead of his competitors, such as John Newlands, as they hadn't taken these ideas into account when making their tables. They had just ordered the elements by their atomic masses. Mendeleev was, however, unable to correctly order the elements in the periodic table. This was because, at the time, we weren't aware of isotopes. We know from our previous video that relative atomic masses need to be calculated using the relative abundances of the isotopes, something that Dmitry Mendeleev didn't know. Another thing that put Dmitry Mendeleev ahead of his competitors was the fact that he made predictions. His predictions included ideas about elements that we were yet to discover. Mendeleev did this by leaving gaps on his periodic table. In those gaps, he wrote predictions about the properties that those elements would have. In the next century to come, we would find out that Dmitry Mendeleev's predictions were very accurate and solidified his title as being the father of the modern periodic table. In the current periodic table, we can see that on the left-hand side of the table, we have all of the different metals. And on the right hand side of the table, we can find all of the non-metals. Whilst this may look just like coincidence, it's all down to the way that we order the periodic table. We know now to order the periodic table based on atomic number, which we should know from the last video is our proton number. The proton number increases by one as we move across the periodic table. Once we get to the end of that row, we have to start a new row and each of those rows are called periods. We can also split the periodic table into groups. And there are nine main groups in the periodic table that you need to be able to recognize. Group one, group two, group three, group four, group five, group six, group seven, group zero, and the transition metals. Within those groups, you'll find patterns of properties. We can also use the periodic table to predict electronic structures. In our last lesson, we learned about electron configuration diagrams. We can use the periodic table like a grid reference to work out what the electronic configuration of a specific element may be. If we use carbon as an example, we can see that it's in group four. We can also see that it's on the second period of the periodic table. That tells us two things. Because it's in group four, it's gonna have four electrons on its outermost shell. And because it's in the second period, that means it's going to have two shells of electrons. We know the first shell can be filled up to two, so we can draw our first shell with two electrons in it. And we know because it's in group four, that it has four electrons on its outer shell. So its electron configuration is two, four. We can double check this because we know its atomic number is six. That means it's going to have six protons and six electrons. And because it's got two in the first shell and four in the second, we know that it's got six overall. Why not have a go at working out the electron configuration diagram of neon using the grid reference method from the periodic table? Pause the video now to wait for the answer. The group one metals are often referred to as the alkali metals. These metals include lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. You only need to know about the properties of lithium, sodium, and potassium, and you need to be able to predict the properties of those further down the group. You should know that when you add the alkali metals to water, they start to fizz. Lithium will start to glide around the top of the water, and it will fizz, releasing hydrogen gas. When we add sodium to water, we can see a more vigorous reaction. We can see that the sodium forms a sphere on the water and glides around faster. 
and if you're lucky, you'll see an orange-yellow flame. Adding potassium to water is a more vigorous reaction and will immediately light to form a lilac flame. Both sodium and potassium will continue to fizz and they both release hydrogen gas like lithium before them. We can predict from these reactions how rubidium and cesium will behave when they react with water. Some general properties of the alkali metals are that they're very soft and can be cut easily with a knife. The further down the group, the softer they are. You should know that they also have very low melting points. And again, the further down the group, the lower the melting point. So why is it then that the elements in group one are very quick to react? And why is it the further down the group, the more reactive they are? Well, it's all to do with their electronic structure. You should hopefully remember that because they are group one metals, they have one electron in their outer shell. The further down the group you go, the more shells of electrons there are. And so that electron in the outermost shell is further away from that positive charge in the nucleus. Potassium's outermost electron can't feel as positive a pull as lithium's outermost electron because potassium's is further away. And so for potassium, it can more easily lose its outermost electron and react. Chlorine is a green gas, whilst bromine is a reddish brown liquid. If we move down to iodine, we notice that that is actually a grey solid, but it will sublime to make a purple gas when heated. We notice that the melting and boiling points increase as we go down the group. We also notice that the densities increase as we go down the group as well. We can react the group 7 elements with metals to make metal halides. The most common metal halide is sodium chloride, and we make that by reacting sodium metal with chlorine gas. We can write a word and symbol equation for this reaction as shown. Sodium plus chlorine makes sodium chloride. The group 7 elements can also react with hydrogen. Hydrogen can react with chlorine to make hydrogen chloride, and when dissolved in water, makes hydrochloric acid. We can also react hydrogen with bromine to make hydrogen bromide, and when dissolved in water, makes hydrobromic acid. We can also do the same thing with iodine to make hydrogen iodide, and that too, when dissolved in water, will make an acid. The group seven elements behave in the opposite way to the group one elements. As we go down the group, we find they become less reactive. This is to do with a very similar reason to group one and how they become more reactive. As you go down group seven, the elements have more and more shells of electrons, meaning their outermost electrons are further and further away from the positive nucleus. That makes it very difficult for them to attract electrons which are negatively charged. And so the further down the group, the more difficult it is to react. That means that elements like fluorine and chlorine are way more reactive than elements like iodine. We can see this pattern of behavior by doing displacement reactions. Displacement reactions involve a more reactive element either kicking out or displacing a less reactive element. We can complete a practical by using dissolved ions of chlorine, bromine and iodine to demonstrate how this works. Because chlorine is more reactive than both bromine and iodine, it will displace both of them from their compounds. However, bromine is not more reactive than chlorine so we'll only be able to displace iodine. Iodine is less reactive than both chlorine and bromine, so when we add it to our solutions, we see no change. Displacement reactions are an example of redox reactions, reduction and oxidation. We're gonna use this example of chlorine displacing bromine from potassium bromide to make potassium chloride and bromine. The way we can work out what has been reduced and what has been oxidized is by writing an ionic equation. Chlorine is a covalent compound, so we keep it as Cl2. Potassium bromide is made up of a potassium ion and a bromine ion, so we can write each of those out in our equation. Potassium chloride is also an ionic compound, so we can write out each of the ions involved there too. However, bromine is now a covalent compound, so we must keep it the same, Br2. Our next step is to now remove the ions that don't change. We call these spectator ions. The equation that we're now left with just involves the things that change. Cl2 plus 2Br- minus makes Br2 and 2Cl-. minus. You should remember from oil rig that oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain of electrons. We can see that the chlorine has gained electrons, so it has been reduced, whereas the bromide 
has actually lost electrons and has been oxidized. Have a look at this displacement reaction to work out which part has been oxidized and which has been reduced. Pause the video now to wait for the answer. The last group of the periodic table that you need to know about are the group zero elements. These are often referred to as the noble gases because they aren't very reactive. Because of this, we call them inert gases, gases that don't react. We notice that as we go down group zero, their melting and boiling points increase, as do their densities. Group zero elements are chemically inert because they've already got the full outer shell of electrons. In our next video, we're going to talk about bonding. And atoms form bonds because they want a full outer shell of electrons. So there's no need for our group zero elements to react if they've already got that. Filament lamps contain thin metal wires. These become very hot and glow brightly when an electric current is passed through them. Explain why argon, krypton or xenon are used in these lamps. 